Thank you, Patrick, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you, everyone at Hunter, for, um, for just welcoming me back. And thank you for all the preparation. And thank you for you guys for leaving your studios and just making your way down here. And you, uh, we're busy there. And, uh, I can say my time in the VFA at, at Hunter was really formative because I, I got to study and be left alone. Uh, and I think that means a lot. So the, lecture, so the lecture is broken into two parts. The first part is called History, and the second part deals with the racial nationalities. On public display in April 2017 in the lobby of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in New York, just outside the doors to the Lexington Hughes Auditorium, there was a draft of a letter from the writer and civil rights activist James Baldwin to his friend and mentor, the painter, Buford Delaney. In the letter written on a notepad, Baldwin uses his vivid and well-honed imagination to describe the lady's paintings through the lens of nature as if nature's mighty elements were metaphors for the man himself. And in an, in an instance of one friend witnessing another. Written while Baldwin was in France, the letter's pin blue cursive stretches across a yellow page in rhythmic waves all the while conjuring the portrait of Delaney as if he were a force of nature painted onto, painted onto the Parisian night's canvas. And on that dark canvas of the inspired imaginary, the portrait of the man who was Baldwin's lifeline to the world is forever tied to exclamations about nature's fury and beauty. One, ima one imagination has sparked the possibilities of another. And I can't help thinking of how we are all tied to each other, that we are one another's lifelines to the world. The lady was a radically different example of manhood for Baldwin and an important model for how to be in and survive the world. And in the early hours when time thins and the clock begins to repeat itself as it faces the waking hours, I can imagine that we are each Baldwin, or at least his witness in front of the, that pad of paper in some hotel in Paris looking through a window and reaching out into the night to pull stars into the page. This is to say that there is power in witnessing and the imagination of an artist, of his country, of its laws, begins there. What follows is a prelude to themes of social justice and witnessing. James Baldwin's example reminds us that our imaginations are as much a part of the world as our physical bodies are. The world is not free of our identities, but instead is composed of what makes us and the opinions we hold. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stated in his I Have a Dream speech of 1963, quote, now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to rise from the dark and desolate valley of segregation to the sunlit path of racial justice. King bore witness to the fact that an, equi an equitable democracy is inev inevitably tied to racial justice. On a much broader scale, the American democracy, while an, optimi an optimistic ideal, was founded alongside slave economy. And both were our extensions of a very particular social and legal imagination. Therefore, the invocation of King's dream is also the invocation of social justice and a matter of bearing witness to where we as a nation have been and to understand or dream of a more optimistic road ahead. Understanding how this nation's racial imaginary often contradicted ideals of freedom is therefore important, if not essential. For example, the segregationist laws and statutes that obtained uh, in our country, uh, obtained in our country from the 19th into the 20th century, carried the name of a racist caricature, Jim Crow. Jim Crow was part of our legal, cultural, economic, political, and institutional imaginary. It or he represented an enduring form of violence in the service of a troubling past that would never let itself be passed. That is to say, to have witnessed Jim Crow, the caricature, as well as Jim Crow, the system of racial oppression, 
would be to have seen how memory lives within us. As the poet and cultural critic Claudia Rankin has stated, quote, our imaginations are creatures as limited as we ourselves are. They are not some special, uh, uninformed realm that transcends the messy realities of our lives and minds. To think of creativity in terms of transcendence is itself specific and partial. A lovely dream, perhaps, but an inhuman one. Witnessing is therefore not a form of transcendence, of rising above the, ugly, the ugliness of the past, but reckoning with it. It allows us to engage the world. Jim Crow was a product of the American racial imaginary, the way concepts of racial identity play in the imagination of those atop the nation's racial hierarchy began Jim Crow. Originally, Jim Crow was a theater character created in the 19th century by Thomas D. Wright, a white performer mimicking African-American performance styles in accordance with mainstream stereotypes of African-Americans. The character wore a, a tattered top hat and battered shoes and was uh, outfitted with rags. Rice performed the character in blackface. Beginning in the 1870s, segregationist laws were given the name of this dehumanizing characterization of African Americans. Jim Crow laws shadowed the lives of millions of African Americans. In much of the nation, black people and white people could not be born in the same hospital or buried in the same graveyard. They could not feast together in some of the same restaurants or starve together in the same jail cell. And of course, public libraries and schools were segregated, as were the art museums, galleries, and art schools, and the literary forums and journals that purported to show the best of American art. The fields of American art and criticism were perpetuating the same lie of African-American visibility, and silence, and inferiority, as was the entirety of our democracy. These circumstances necessitated the tradition of African-American art that, and, that and that tradition's equation of creative rights with civil rights and civil rights with human rights. But laws set the terms. In, in the infamous Plessy versus Ferguson Supreme Court decision of 1896 upheld, uh, it upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws uh, for public facilities as long as the segregated facilities were equal. But left to the discretion of this, in, uh, this power, nothing was ever, quote unquote, equal, equal for African Americans and other people of color. For example, Virginia's state uh, constitution of 1902, influenced by Plessy, the Plessy case, set the terms by which whites would come to know and not know, sense, and yet not see the lives of African American Virginians. It, institu it, it instituted poll taxes and, liter and literacy tests that almost completely disenfranchised black voters. It meant that their right to vote was not protected because it was left to the discretion of those grading the test. For instance, in order to vote, count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap with accuracy, or name every U.S. Uh, citizen accurately. The effects of the decision were widespread. Virginia's legislature passed rigid laws to ensure that African, African Americans and whites stayed in separate realms. Imagine following the dates, uh, imagine following the uh, accumulation of these dates as a landscape where laws uh, accumulate, gather momentum, and have dire effects on lives. In 1904, the General Assembly gave streetcar companies the power to segregate passengers by race. Residential segregation came in 1912, two acts, two, uh, and two acts passed in the 1920s uh, were the most specific segregation laws in the country, here we didn't still with Virginia. The Racial Integrity Act forbade interracial marriage, and the Public uh, Assemblages Act mandated the separation of whites and blacks in areas of public entertainment, like movie theaters and dance halls. What's more, laws dating back to the 1700s, which, uh, which had made the crime of vagrancy, made acts of simple being black and in public misdemeanors and petty felonies. The resulting arrest ensured the availability of black labor and sustained the exploitation of black bodies. This is the beginning of what the uh, scholar and activist Michelle Alexander has called the new Jim Crow. 
Of course, the state of the nation, the 1920s and 30s, also saw heightened anxieties over issues of race and ethnicity, as evidence in the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. And as the recent events in Charlottesville remind us, the troubling history remains at our front door. The legal imagination bred violent public realities, which the result, with the result that a culture of witness and violence arose. During the Civil Rights Movement, the Freedom Riders used nonviolent protests as a form of witnessing in the march toward social justice. Their plan was to travel by bus and occupy bus terminals in states actively defying federal desegregation laws. They were young, racially, and religiously diverse, idealistic, and rebellious, and they were willing to travel unprotected through the South despite the reality of being confronted with violent mobs. The Freedom Riders were the realization of, the new, of a new American vision of the future, a new bloodline of democracy worth fighting for, one based in an imagined on May 14, 1961, two buses carrying freedom riders left Atlanta for Birmingham, Alabama. The first was confronted near Anniston, Alabama by 200 men armed with chains and clubs who heaved a firebomb through the bus window. When the second bus arrived at the Birmingham station, it too was met by Klansmen and the riders were beaten by a vicious mob disheartened and battered the initial wave of freedom riders left that night. A second wave of student protesters arrived in Birmingham to continue the rides. This new group included now Congressman John Lewis. Each participant had signed a last will and testament before the party. Can you think about that? And this is a side note. You signed a last will and testament meaning that you're ready to die. And these are college students, 19, 20, 21. Some were seniors ready to graduate, but they left school before they could take their final exams in order to participate in this. Each participant had signed their last will and testament before embarking. They were convinced that neither jail, nor extreme violence, nor even death could stop the ideals of social equality and civil rights. In Birmingham, they were arrested by the segregationists and a notoriously violent Bull Connor. Birmingham's commissioner for a public safety, a public safety guide. And in spite of the U.S. Attorney General Robert, Robert F. Kennedy, uh, despite his attempts to intercede on their behalf, early the next morning, the riders were driven to the state line between Alabama and Tennessee and left near the train station to consider in that early darkness whether to re return home or continue the rides against segregation. They chose to continue despite the palpable intimidation. But at the Birmingham station, they couldn't find a bus driver willing to drive them. Another mob swelled, in a, uh, swelled and instead, the Ku Klux Klan dressed in full regalia surrounded them. It took the inter intervention again of the Kennedy administration to convince Alabama Governor John Patterson to act. On May 20, uh, 20th, 1961, the riders were given an escort uh, out of Alabama by troopers uh, from Birmingham moving toward Montgomery. For the second wave of riders, that was when the real violence began. Weapons flashed, and hell broke loose. The mob in Montgomery attacked journalists first. They, they assailed any reporter in sight, breaking cameras and microphones as if all the violence of that sunny afternoon could be silenced or hidden. The riders represented a, a significant challenge to the culture of white dominance that had flowered and grown deep roots during enslavement. Jim Crow laws were the last protections of this century's old legacy. That the riders had gained the support of the federal government, uh, of the federal government made their threat, the threat of change and progress, very real. It was as, it was as if history the history of generations of Southern violence had set upon the riders to remove them and the ideas they represented from the world. Approximately 200 men and women rushed them. For the riders, there was nowhere to run. John Lewis was knocked unconscious by an attacker with a wooden crate. Another rider, Jim's word here, remembers being thrown to the ground, stomped on and beaten with a steel rod. 
The Kennedy uh, administration's representative was bludgeoned with a pipe and fell to the ground, bled. He said it was all out war. The police finally stopped the attack, and, and in response to the violence, the Attorney General, uh, Attorney General uh, sent several hundred uh, federal marshals and uh, National Guard in order to restore order. At Jackson's bus depot, the soldiers formed a gauntlet leading to the train station. But to avoid embarrassing uh, the embarrassing photographs, the Kennedy administration had conspired with local officials to the local officials to have the young activists taken into police custody immediately after their arrival. And they were arrested and sent to parchment uh, penitentiary, but parchment jail without being questioned. In images, their eyes hold shadows of the violent exchanges, capturing indirectly the first instances of their extraordinary acts of selflessness. On the road, the riders learned the sounds of bombs and saw the quick flashes of weapons of use, guns, knives, pitchforks. In the bus depots, they heard, sh uh, they heard shouted death threats that dug into the air. They saw the violence fists can do to bodies that do not resist the impact of numbers. <coughs> I can imagine that the eyes of some, of some were cast low and sharp, taking in only what was required from one moment to the next. It was a matter of survival. Hundreds of young activists began traveling to the state to join the riots and be arrested as a matter of nonviolent protest. The jails eventually grew overcrowded with, with freedom riots. Because of their protest, Robert Kennedy filed a petition asking the Interstate Commerce Commission to issue rules and regulations prohibiting segregation in interstate transportation and terminal facilities. What's more, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 were surely influenced by the rioters' radically patriotic activism. After the riots were in prison, farm workers and community activists in Greenwood, Mississippi sent for, sent for student nonviolent coordinating committee members to help register voters uh, in their county. The riders' momentum had spread throughout the state, from Jackson to Hines County to Greenwood to Macomb and Hattiesburg, despite opposition from the local police forces, the Ku Klux Klan, and what the White Citizens Council. Witnessing has its cause. In 1964, the civil rights workers James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner disappeared on the road to Meridian, Mississippi. Cheney, who was born in Meridian, was active in Cheney. Uh, only right here is the name Cheney. Was born in Meridian, was active in civil rights uh, work as, uh, during his childhood. The county school board has suspended him for wearing an NAACP patch at his segregated high school. In 1962, at the age of 19, he participated in the Freedom Rides from Tennessee to Mississippi. In 1963, he began volunteering for the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, promoting voter registration and helping poor workers from outside the state assimilated to local and often intimate, intimately tied communities. One of those workers were, uh, was Michael uh, Schwerner, a member of CORE's New York chapter, who had volunteered to assist the registration efforts in Meridian. Schwerner and his wife, Rita, beca uh, became leaders of the county's field office. In June 1964, they and Cheney said, uh, went door to door attempting to register voters, even reaching out to working class whites. That summer, known as Freedom Summer, the Queens College uh, student, Andrew Goodman, also volunteered for Corps in uh, Meridian. On June 21, 1964, the three men were returning to Meridian after investigating the burning of Mount Zion, the Methodist Church, a few miles outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi. The church had agreed to let the site be a border, uh, border education registration uh, uh, station. 
They were intercepted and arrested by the deputy sheriff of that county, Cecil Price, who was a Klansman. After the three were released that evening, they were stopped again just before reaching the neighboring county and taken into custody by, by Price. The deputy, the deputy drove the three young men uh, to a desolate but deserted area where they were turned over to the clan. Their bodies were uncovered on, earthen, on an earthen dam on August 4, 1964. Under Jim Crow, the lines between violence and safety were as thin as the three uh, activists' lives were short. And through the fight for social justice and imagining more equitable tomorrows, their courageous form of witnessing as protest leaves us with impressions of lives lived with purpose. Democracy, social justice, and witnessing are wed. They're as wed to each other as they are to the imaginaries that flow through each and gather in forms of the legal and cultural acts that, gives us, that give us context. The imagination is formed by the evidence of the people, and Jim Crow is as much our inheritance as is the hope we place in art and our hearts. In this way, how we witness shapes what is seen and the moral inherit inheritances we own. Freedom is not a given. The concept is a work in progress stretching back to this nation's beginning. But if it is ever to be realized, we must each bear witness to the truths within our individual experiences as well as the state of our collective reality as a nation. I can picture this sight of freedom in a way similar to James Baldwin envisioning his friend Beaver Delaney, a place on a page or maybe a canvas where what is right and the vision of where of what is right forms something speculative yet real and made from what I and we have learned from the world. And I believe that it is here, in this space of witnessing and vulnerability, that we are afforded a glimpse of each other as utterly human. To suggest that there is a value in seeing this is to say that living within us is a valuable piece of a larger human archive of empathy, an archive that will outlive us. It is the Freedom Riders' dream still resonating. It is the voice that spoke against Jim Crow and did not die. It is the artwork of the children of immigrants that tells of their ancestors' lives. What stands and witnesses there is a continuity, a vision of tomorrow that is not ignorant of the past we have seen and survived. And I would argue that achieving it is the responsibility of each of us. Part two. Here's a long quote from Claudia Rankin about the racial imaginaries. Two years ago, I asked for collaborators in the founding of the Racial Imaginary Institute. We were initially a small group of three or four that expanded into a core group of ten. We are, we are an intersectional group of all races and genders and sexual orientations. Under the, under the curatorial arm of the Institute, we met on Sundays in person or by conference call to discuss how to publicly think about white supremacy. Our discussions happened as unarmed black people across the country were being killed. Alt-right groups marched with tiki torches on Charlottesville, an, an event that ended with three deaths, and the president who was run up to holding office, emboldened and amplified to hate against immigrants, against Muslims, against women, against queers, against minorities, and continued to make policy out of racist rhetoric. Black Americans were being targeted by the police, and white Americans were calling the police on people because they are black. As a group, we decided to use theorist Sarah Ahmed's a phenomenology of whiteness as an organizing thesis for events moving forward. <clears throat> These steps led to two years of collaboration 
of labor that culminated in tribes, the racial imaginary institutes, by you on whiteness. This is my this is my response to From the positive responses to on whiteness, the exhibition, the symposium, the performance residencies, and biennial, it became clear to me that a lot of people are relying on the arts for ways of understanding this troubling moment we're in. This viewing public isn't looking for a guide per se, but a foothold within the vast landscape of the racial imaginary and the kinds of white privilege that emerge from histories of racial blindness. For many, on whiteness was the beginning of this kind of important questioning. For others, it generated spaces to meet new allies and see personally held forms of witnessing in new creative forms. These kinds of pivots and orientation begin with questions. Consequently, I began to think of curation as simply, but not so simply, the posing of questions, questions as speculative and troubling as they are necessary. And so um, we were founded on the idea of um, everyone is even. This is a, uh, no one is above the other. We're all on the same plane, right? So this idea of equality as a curatorial team uh, is something to the core. So to say that you know I'm the Ron Brookstore and I am the head curator, that doesn't exist within uh, the curatorial strategy we have. And once that's said. Um, she brought us together. I guess we were all parts that she was interested in. We had different skill sets, you know. Uh, Monica, uh, you know, Yoon and Kathy Hung and myself and Joanna Samuels, who's a curator. Uh, we had, you know, a few more people. We, we, we met in our apartment informally for like two years to figure out what is it that we wanted to do, or what, how we move you know, forward. So, you know, us coming together it was really about, you know, some people came, some people left. Because it's really rigorous, the idea of we're going to get together, we're going to talk. Usually it was almost every Sunday, you know, at a place, I and mean, that's a real kind of dedication. But ideally, we, we follow the mission of, during this particular moment, we do have to challenge toxic whiteness. White supremacy, has entered the very fabric. So I began, I began this presentation with this idea of Jim Crow, right? Historically, without perspective, we really can't take in the moment. So this, this idea of Jim Crow, this idea of segregation, this idea, this is as American as we would take by. <laughs> oh, that's, that's deep inside. All right, right? And so coming together, we, we teamed up with the kitchen, and then we all had, so, so the parts of us that had the symposium, and then there were the parts of us who had the, the sort of the visual art side. Um, we, and so it was basically by vote, egalitarian. 
basically by vote, everything was decided, you know, there are people, you know, who have certain strengths and people who could take the lead in other things. And so we're just like one multi-bodied body. Did that change? Yeah. Um, how does You know, it's, it's a conversation, right? It's a conversation. My witnesses as a straight black man are counted by somebody else who calls me out on something, right? And so the, cur the cur curatorial strategy is question. That's the curatorial strategy. It's question. You say something, what's the value of this? What are your blindnesses? And so if we're critiquing the blindnesses of white supremacy, we have to first begin with critiquing and being open and vulnerable to, right? other people to question where are your blind spots as a man and why are you picking this artist right when we have the same one over here so it takes many voices you know to sort of critique it and so what we end up with is the best that we can do and they are the result of multiple conversations over a year a year and a half um, and we continue to grow we continue to uh, add new voices to this particular conversation but it's not, whiteness is not at the center of what we were doing. It's the object of critique. But it's not the center of what we were doing, right? The center, the core idea is to denormalize whiteness, right? But it's not the center of what we were doing. So the first iteration of the racial imaginary was at the Whitney talk with uh, the uh, Emmett Till painting. Dana, Dana, she was just so close to her. Oh, she was there. Some of you may have been at her talk. And so the Whitney, <laughs> the Whitney had a, a conversation, right, around around her painting that was there on display, it, and it was of Emmett Till, right. Some some of you saw the painting in the Biennial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The physical nature of it is completely different than the painting as seen on a flat screen. You get close to that painting, you can see she cut that mouth out. A knife dug into it. You can see the physicality of the process, right? Now, on any other painting, she's a very physical painter. Can I say that? Right? She's a very physical painter. Her paintings are energetic. They have a lot of energy and they bounce the brush strokes, bounce back and forth, but then we're dealing with a particular instance, right, in which that energetic presence does not work for the subject. Huh. So if you're dealing with the subject of a lynched 14-year-old, I mean, to be lynched means you're mutilated and tortured, how then does your practice, right, conflict with the subject? Right? And so it led me to actually think about, okay, as a white woman, who do you connect with more, Emmett Till, or do you understand white women more, right? 
I didn't say she actually uh, agreed with the white woman, uh, Carolyn Bryant, the woman who lied and said this 14-year-old winked at me because she lied. She came out and said she lied. I said, well, you, if you know white women, paint a picture of her. I mean, in my mind, because that's the closest to people that you know. Okay, so to reproduce that, right, to reproduce that image of this tortured and, and murdered child, where is the intimacy? Because you're reproducing a photograph. The unique the unique thing, check in with yourself. You know white people better than I do. You know white women more intimately than I do. And what kind of trouble does, would it actually take you to actually approach that? I, you, know, you know what I'm saying? In terms of being in tune with yourself, right? And so the first instance of the racial imaginary was to actually speak about this uh, painting at the Whitney, and it, 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 it was a very formative moment for us in that we were working with a, um, an institution, a corporate institution, right? The Whitney is a corporate institution. By corporate institution, I mean it's right next to the High Line, right? It's in a changing Chelsea. It's a million dollar, million dollar, million, it's a heavily funded institution. And so there are layers of responsibility that come to anything that's shown in that particular place. And what are, what's the benefits of working at the kitchen? Right? And so we're dealing with different kinds of institutional flexibility. We're dealing with different kinds of conversations you can have with the, with the institution. Right? So the kitchen became an extension of our family. The curatorial team is top notch, and they and they and, they, and so we, we had this kind of because we knew who we are, right? So it's not just the visual artist I'm asking to know who you are intimately and paint those or make those or build those, right? Images that you know best because you know yourself best. As as a curatorial team, that year or year and a half, we got to know ourselves as a group voice. And so when it came time to actually make this exhibition. We had conversations with them. We had honest conversations with them. Right? And then we kind of found ourselves as well. Point two. 